Hi, this is Henning Stahlberg. Today is October 16, 2017. I want to show you how focus can be used to process um, images, plain images, not movies or stacks or something, just plain images containing 2D crystals. So I have here in this central window a collection of a few files. Um, I'm working in a folder which is called data proteins uh, slash 2D crystals, which is an example folder, and in here there's just one folder called TIFF. Um, you can call it whatever you want, you can place it also elsewhere. And in this here I have a few um, MRC images. Um, if I go into one of these um, with clip info, for example, um, this shows us that these are 3800 pixels in size, only one frame, um, and there's 1.34 angstroms per pixel. This is the MRC header that I'm looking at with the clip command. Um, so those are essentially 4K images from a K2 image. There's also two smaller images, I think. Um, can I look into this? I'm not sure. Yes, I can. So that's a 2K image. Um, I think the pixel size is not correct in this TIFF header, but it's a 2K image. And the other file is a 4K image with the wrong pixel size. And this is uh, mode byte, and the previous ones were mode byte, and before that was mode floating point. Okay. So this is all we have at the moment, just these files. <coughs> I'm now calling focus, I'm doing this somewhere else, or just usually what I do is I do a git pull to update my local software to whatever is on the GitHub right now, and then I run build all, um, which compiles um, the current source code, which I just pulled from GitHub with git pull, so that I have the latest version of the program and the scripts and the MRC package and everything that is included. Um, and then I launch Focus um, from anywhere. Um, so, and now I want to create a new project. And for this project, I add a new project here and I navigate to this path where um, I want to work, and this was the 2D crystal folder with the TIFF files in there, but we are not using them, we are just working here. And this is a new project, I initialize it from the master, it's a 2D electron crystallography project, and I call this 2D test, or whatever, something. This is a demonstration, and then focus launches. I'm working here on a Ubuntu Linux machine, which is nice and fast and offers uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Um, but I'm recording the screen on a Macintosh and I'm connecting to the Ubuntu machine from the Macintosh via TeamViewer. Um, so I can record this 4K screen that I'm displaying here. Um, and at the right end of this screen I have a window running top here. Um, so we can see there's TeamViewer running but not much else. And down here we can see what the two graphics cards are doing. At the moment they're not doing much to GeForce 1080. And down here is the 48 cores of this very nice machine with a lot of RAM. 256 gigabyte of RAM or so. So when we launch Focus we end up in this um, library view and there's nothing at the moment because there's no files uh, imported. Um, so you want to import them. And I go to the import section now. Um, and we have to tell here, top left, where we get these proteins from. And they should actually stay right here, because this is where our TIFF folder is. Um, so we are importing now from the same folder where we will work on. Usually you wouldn't do this, but for now we do it. And these are 2D images that were in the subfolder TIFF. Um, and these are already game corrected, so we do not need any of this here. This only applies for movies. 
dark subtracted or gain corrected movies so we don't need this now right now we are just dealing only with this one the files and if I rescan this folder focus finds all kinds of 2d images but there are no aligned stacks or raw stacks you would use these in other settings um, these are the file names that um, 2dx or focus found this is a 2dx scripts running here and these are the folder locations that these will be imported into. They will all go into auto and then a folder with a number. And we can already now define some scripts that we want to run on them, but I don't do this now. Um, and these file names here, they, they could contain information, but I'm not doing this now. So well, maybe I do it. So the separation in the file name is an underscore and my first f field there is a specimen name and, and everything else you can ignore. Um, just to see if we get this this file name memorized somewhere. So if I import this now, they are imported. And this is very quick because they are just copied over and there's no scripts running on them. So this is all done now. There's a few more to come. So now they are imported. <coughs> we left them in this TIFF folder, so they are still present. And if you now look at the library, there's our auto folder here, which I can open. And the specimen name is now the first field. The first field that we had here until the, the um, underscore, underline here was just the date when this was recorded or for this one year it would be the entire image name. So we are in the library and there are all these columns here they contain nothing and many of them we will not need so I will just go into any of them by double clicking and if I double click this I open in the process tab this one image and here I have these images uh, these scripts that we can run on this. This is a 2D image. So what we need to run first is this import 2D image, um, <coughs> which I just run here with this run button. And if I do so, um, this progress bar goes from left to right, and all kinds of things are done with this image, which you can see if you double click this script then it opens and this is the C shell script template where the title of the script is defined here and the sort order under which it appears in this list is given then and then here is the set of parameters that will show up here so that we can edit them and underneath here is the parameters that are then um, prepared when we would press the play button this play button if you would press that then these numbers here that are in this database would be filled in into these these lines here so that these variables are accessible for the remainder of the script and the remainder of the script is then down here. Um, so right now this ran and it has <coughs> listed here the raw image and this was a 4K image with one frame only and the min and max were um, between minus 400 and plus 400. This was a floating point image, mode 2. And after rescaling it, it's still the same here. And there is a Fourier transform computed also for this thing. Um, if we switch this back to the preview, we have here the raw image and the slightly histogram adjusted probably also image and then the Fourier transform. Um, the <coughs> some parameters here were set CS and kilovolt and magnification and so they were set from default values. Um, some of the default values are accessible here in the settings tab for example the microscope default values and kilovolts are here um, if there's nothing known about these images, then it uses what is here as preferences set for the microscope you have. But um, if you have an old data set from lots of images that were recorded with a different 
machine. One could also go now and adjust this manually here. For example, if we say this was a 2.0 millimeter CS and a 200 kilovolt microscope, you could adjust it here and then save this as default value um, for future files to import by clicking, clicking this button. So if I would press yes here, then the default definitions for all the parameters that we just would have adjusted, which is not only CS and kilovolt, but everything else also, would be saved as a default. Um, this would not apply for the images that we have already imported, but if I would have another many images not yet imported, then upon importing they would get these values that we would have manually defined, but I'm not doing this here. And actually this came from a 2.7 CS microscope and was a 300 kilovolt machine. It was a Titan Cryos. Um, <coughs> so if I now want to process this 2D crystal images, we have to skip the alignment section because this is for movies. And we have to skip the process section, which is um, also for single particle things. I think these scripts work, but for 2D crystals, it's more interesting to run these 2D crystal scripts here, which are the former 2DX scripts. And I start with the first one, which is the initialization of all kinds of parameters. Um, which are shown here on the top. Um, so these parameters, some of them are interesting as default parameters. They are computed based on um, the image size and pixel size and some other things. Um, but many other values are just reset to zero. Um, the image site length, for example, is not yet known as a script. We'll put number here or we'll put length there. There's a magnification now, <coughs> um, which is correct, but init files and parameters is the next script we need to run. This script um, <coughs> calculates, for example, um, this script, for example, calculates the image site length just from the header of the image so that's that's now filled in here and it also calculates the magnification um, so it calculates the magnification from the pixel size here we have to define the pixel size and then the hardware pixel size uh, of the camera in micrometers and this was a k2 with five micrometers and these two numbers then are calculated back to a magnification that was correspond to that. If you would have used a Tietz camera with 14 micrometer pixel size and run this, then, but you are sure about the pixel size in angst terms on your image, then it would come up with a different magnification. So the, the script would um, correct these numbers here. Um, there we have access to the raw image and the non-masked image. There's nothing really interesting. The next um, script calculates the Fourier transform of the image, which is this one here, and <coughs> also the downsampled Fourier transform, um, which are shown here on the right. Yeah, we can look at this later. So here's the Fourier transform. If I open this, uh, it opens full screen. This is a 2D crystal. There's diffraction spots. This is actually a nice one. There's a ton ring. Um, this is a very nice one. There's more than one lettuce. This is very confusing here. Um, on the right mouse click, we have all kinds of options now for 2D crystals. For example, we can adjust with B, make it brighter, or with N, like ni night, make the Fourier transform darker. Um, we can zoom in or out with comma and dot, um, and so on. There's lots of options. Um, T displays the tilt axis once we have this in the raw image, and shift T would display this for the final map. we we'll come to this later. With escape, we can leave this full screen browser. 
So the next script computes the defocus and tilt in this image. And um, I do not want to record or calculate the tilt geometry right now based on a defocus gradient, but just the defocus. And for speed reasons, since we run on an Ubuntu machine, I can run GCTF, that's faster. Um, Kai Zhang's program that's amazingly fast, that produces um, <coughs> ton ring fits. Um, typically, CTF fitting programs have problems with 2D crystals. If these 2D crystal spots in negative stain, for example, are really strong, then they are easily mistaken for a ton ring, for a white ton ring. But in this image, it worked. Um, so the left is a simulation and the right is from the data. This looks correct. Um, and if I would use CTF find, the same would hopefully come out, but this runs much longer. So the, here is CTF find. It runs now on uh, 31 cores with hyperthreading. Um, the output of these programs shows up here. You can always switch the verbosity to the highest and then I see more. What runs here is a modified version of CTF find 3 from Nico Grigoriev. CTF find um, was modified here so that it uh, takes one important additional parameter, which is here in the fifth um, parameter card. Um, and if this is set to 1, then CTF find would skip astigmatism determination and only adjust in a one-dimensional search the ton rings. And we do this to look for defocus gradients on 7x7 seven seven tiles across the image. And then CTF find 3 becomes very fast. If it's only doing a one-dimensional search, um, assuming that the astigmatism for every tile is the same. But here right now I'm running this with a zero, so uh, meaning that I do not search for I do search for astigmatism. Um, and if you modify a program by somebody else, then usually we have edit 2dx or focus or something before the name. But it's still 99% is Nico Gigoyev's Fortran program here. Um, parameters are shown here. Um, for example, the defocus is 9,000 angstroms in one direction and 10,000 angstroms in the other direction with an angle of 75 degrees for the first axis towards the x-axis. That's still the GCTF values. Oh no, CTF find is also done. And these values are now from uh, CTF find. Yeah can always hover the mouse over these variables and then see some instructions. Um, yeah. So let me verify if this is correct by just displaying the ton rings here. With N I make this n darker and with C I can display the ton rings here. Let us see and this looks good. I can with C click this on and off. This looks good. Otherwise, I could move um, the ton rings with um, cursor up and down or um, page up and down on the keyboard or I can modify these values here um, by hand if I want to. And these lines are true um, astigmatism. So these are zero crossings of the simulated CTF. If I set the astigmatism, for example, to something very extreme then it becomes elliptic, and then later on these become hyperboles, as astigmatism should be. So, let me see if this works. Yeah. Um, so, and if you would click on accept, then these values are taken over into the database, but I just click on reload to have the original values back, because they looked nice. Um, <coughs> The next thing would be the lattice determination. And this is something that usually with the first image you want to process, it fails. And what we do here, let me just switch on that we see all the temporary files here. Keep large temporary files and then I run this again and we see a bit more. So what this does is following um, ideas of Richard Henderson and Sriram Subramaniam that were in electron diffraction processing 
used. So the first thing is um, the image is edge tapered so that the edge is going towards equal gray along all edges and that eliminates from the Fourier transform the cross wire from the middle. And then we have a power spectrum and this is now only the center of the power spectrum. And this is band pass filtered, so high pass and low pass filtered to eliminate too strong contrast and also the center um, there's some search pattern that tries to eliminate any artifacts and continued streaks that are still in the middle and also the rest of the cross wire is eliminated. And the next thing would be then to further band pass filtering this and now these peaks get stronger and then this is masked again so the outside is still masked. So and in this image now this is still similar to the original power spectrum in this image a peak search looks for peaks and if I look at this here I guess we have something on only one half because it's Friedel symmetric left and right so on one half they have probably like 50 peaks or so these peaks that we can see by eye and this 50 is an important parameter that we have to adjust here and it's this parameter here the initial number of peaks these are global parameters, so I adjust them for all images. And I set this to 50. And so what happens then is that on all these 50 peak positions, let me just open this here. This is the image that we just looked at. On all these 50 positions, um, the peak is searched, and with Shift P, with Shift P, I can display these coordinates. So this is this Shift P. P, the view, the to view the peak list. Um, this is less than 50, so maybe it's on the entire Fourier transform. This was at 60 before. So the strongest peaks here are found. Some of them look really odd. I don't know why it would pick a peak there. Or maybe this is the wrong peak list. I can load a peak list here, load peak list, but I don't go into this. But the idea would be that um, it searches for the most important peaks here. Let's say it found all these very strong peaks. And then it makes a copy of this entire pattern and shifts it with this peak to the origin. So we have 50 copies of this pattern all centered on one of these peaks. And then these 50 copies are averaged. And by doing so, we obtain this origin shifted average power spectrum which is this one. And this one has now no missing uh, reflections anymore. If you have systematic absences in your lattice, this pattern would not have it. And this is now much more complete than before. And <coughs> we can, in this pattern now, search for um, peaks um, that would then be the full set of reflections. Um, and I think this is the this is now the peak P. No, it's also not. I don't know which button this is, but there's another peak list now in this pattern. And these positions of peaks are then used to find a lattice. So we start with a text file of x and y coordinates of peaks plus peak height from this pattern. And this pattern, this origin shifted average power spectrum, should show something that makes sense. So it should show a pattern where one could by hand click on the lattice. And I could do this by hand because I know my protein quite well in the meantime, so I know that probably here's one axis and here's the other axis, and then I can I can recognize here the first and second and third and fourth spot, and in the other direction there's the first and second and or maybe here, first and second and third and fourth spot. So this is doable by hand, and then hopefully the computer can do it. So then on this thing here, the computer was looking for a lettuce using the program get lettuce here. And get lettuce is a program written by Brian Gibson that um, guesses a lettuce based on these peaks that we just discussed by looking for different vectors between neighboring peaks and then looking for the most prominent difference vector that is the strongest one and the shortest one, and then looking for the second most prominent difference lattice vector that is orthogonal or linearly independent from the first one in a different direction, 
and also very strong and very short. And these two are then guessed as being the lattice vectors. And that usually works, um, but has a problem if you have um, too many overlapping lattices. And they only can only also can only find only one lattice. The alternative algorithm is find lattice, and that is a program that uh, needs to be told what the real space dimensions of your crystal are. So it needs to have precise values here for the real unit cell length. And I know that on these crystals here, the real unit cell is 134 by 134 angstroms with a 90 degree angle between them. Um, and if you know this, then you could use find lattice, and find lattice will search for the known lattice by creating um, a hypothetical test vector set and rotating it around in your image and try where it snaps in with these peaks. And that allows then to find more than one lattice, and it also allows to accommodate um, lattice distortions if your crystal was tilted in the microscope. So usually we start with cat lattice, if you don't know anything about the protein, and if we know the real space dimensions, we continue with find lattice. So for the moment it was cat lattice, and now let's see what cat lattice would have done here. So if I click on this origin shifted power spectrum, and now press on L, the key L is displaying the lattice here. Um, it shows a lattice, N to make it darker. This looks actually good. The first lattice is the red circle, the second one is the blue one. This looks like a reasonable lattice, so it found it. There is a second lattice register, um, which I get with S, and that is not yet existing. So the second lattice is not known. But this looks good. So um, this I know that my crystal has a 90 degree angle, but this lattice here, what was just measured, does not look at all like a 90 degree lattice. So this is more like looking like the 60 degree vector pair. So it must have quite some tilt. But for the time being, we don't know this yet. Um, <coughs> and we also told this script to not look for crystal tilt. Somewhere is here this flag to say tilt geometry from lattice. No. Yeah, so we did not look for crystal tilt. Um, but at least it worked. We could have gone for a defocus gradient by using CTF find or GCTF. I stay with CTF find and try this, but now I want to look for the where is this? The defocus gradient with the yes here. Let's see if this works. So what this would do, do now is it cuts tiles, 7 by 7 tiles from this image. Each tile is 2000 by 2000 pixels. So the tiles are overlapping because our entire image is only 4K by 4K. Um, <coughs> and then it runs CTF find 3 on the central tile with great detail. Um, so the central tile will be searched for defocus and astigmatism. And after that it will run CTF find on the outer tiles, the other 3x3 three three and then 5x5 five five and then 7x7 seven seven tiles, starting from the central tile. And only adjust defocus, not search for astigmatism anymore, so it's faster. Um, and determine a grid of defocus values on 7x7 seven seven locations. So here is CTF find running on 31 cores. That's good. We have to wait for this to finish. And then we see the, the panel. Yeah, this takes as long as before. Um, here are parameters that are used for the search range for CTF find. So we search from 2 micrometer defocus to 50, no, from 200 nanometer to 5 micrometer defocus. That's a long search range and 250 angstroms step size. So this is why it takes so long. So now CTF find has determined for the central tile, which is this one, 
the defocus and is running over all the other tiles. And it has produced lots of ton ring fits, which are all these here. And they all look okay. And the bottom right one here, to me, looks larger in diameter than this one here, but we will see later. So this is on overlapping 2K images um, across the image. See, the find was one on all of them. And there is a marked version of this file. So on all these defocus measurements, um, there's another program that fits a planar plane, a tilted plane across these defocus measurements. And um, the measurements that are outliers from this fit they are crossed out and then the fit is done in iterations iteratively with the remaining uh, positions until there's a good fit to at least half of the numbers of defocus values here um, that is on a plane. And if I now display with T the tilt geometry then we see here that on the right side there is less under focus, bigger ton rings, on the left is more under focus, smaller ton rings, we saw this before. And we have a tilt axis that is, um, should be indicated down here, the tilt angle is 48 degrees, so this looks like strong tilt. And the tilt axis is minus 69 degrees, so which means from the x-axis um, minus 69 um, so usually positive values are counterclockwise mathematically positive and this minus 69 means it's from the x-axis down here this angle minus 69 degrees and that defines the tilt axis and we have a negative tilt angle of minus 48 which means on the upside we have less under focus and at the bottom end we have more under focus that's the definition of a negative tilt angle. So now we have the tilt angle known, which is here. Um, this tilt axis and tilt angle, they are known for the um, for the grid, for the carbon film. And now we can do this lattice search again um, with find lattice. Um, so it will probably find the same lattice as before. It should. This is the same lattice as before, it was the same program. But now the crystal tilt axis, the crystal tilt angle, um, axis and angle can be calculated. And this depends on how the lattice lies on the grid. If the, if the crystal would be in a different orientation on this piece of carbon film, then the crystal tilt axis would be different because this is the tilt axis from the point of view of the crystal. And if the crystal rotates, then it feels that the tilt axis is different. So once its feet are uphill and once its head is uphill, and so if you if you lie on a mountain slope, then you, know, you feel different if you lie in different directions. So the crystal would see a different tilt geometry than the carbon film. And this is reflected in these variables here. Um, okay, the next script would just refine these values in case you would have a different tilt geometry, then the crystal tilt axis would be refined. The next thing is uh, CTF correction, and we do here face flipping in this image um, in stripes, in 21 stripes, before everything else, before unbending. So here we, at the moment, the processing is very hopeful and ambitious, and we try to process this image up to four angstrom resolution. And based on four angstrom resolution and a 48 degree tilt angle, uh, the script here determined that we need 21 stripes across this image. So that within one stripe, the resolution limitation from wrong defocus on the edges of a stripe is never worse than four angstroms, because we hope for four angstroms. If you would set the resolution target to three angstroms, then you would end up with more stripes even, and then it takes even longer. So now we have the image um, CTF corrected by only doing face flipping. So the contrast um, of the image should be as before. Um, now the lattice, there's also some masking ongoing here. Maybe the last stripe wasn't correctly computed. Or maybe it's the way it should be. So this is now face flipped. Um, 
and we don't see much difference here. You know, the face flipping doesn't change ton rings, not a Wiener filter. Um, so now we use this to find spots in the image and we found 94 spots. So if I go to this image, this is now after CTF face flipping and make it a bit darker and with N and then look for points. These are spots that lie on the lattice. There's more than one lattice. The other one, the second lattice is not yet defined. So, and there's not all spots. So there's some spots that are not found. I can manually edit them now if I go into the spot selection tool here um, by clicking a few on here. Um, but I could also change the um, this is control right mouse button save spot list. I could also do this um, automatically by changing in the spot list search the parameters here to be less restrictive but I don't care about this at the moment I just go into the unbending process which would then move this image or warp it and stretch it so that the crystal becomes perfect. And this is already done, this is a fast machine. The full log file is down there. Um, so the verbosity shows me that um, this is a very good image. We have 30 IQ1 spots and 70 IQ2 spots. And here is the cross correlation map between the reference and the image. And with L I see the lattice here and this shows us that for some areas the points are spot on where they should be and for other areas the image needs unbending because the crystal lattice nodes are not where they should be, which is crystal distortions. Um, and there are some areas where there's very little crystal, like here for example, and other areas where the crystal is strong but needs unbending here. Um, this is a cross collation map. And the unbanding has then unbanned this image. So there's a vector plot. I double click this and it opens this PostScript file. And there we see these lines that indicate with 10 times exaggeration, 10 times exaggeration, yeah, indicate um, how this image was warped to become a better crystal. The color here is the direction, the length is the 10 times exaggerated length, and in the middle there was no crystal. Um, so, and this has led to a better Fourier transform, which is this here. And this now has much sharper spots than before. So they are now, many here are now really just one pixel in size. Um, <coughs> if I indicate the lattice now, it should be much easier to find spots here. So, um, if I now run the spot list determination again, then in the second round it will use um, up to IQ8 spots and before it was only up to IQ5, now it's up to IQ8. And now it found 235 spots, so if I open this Fourier transform from unbend 1, now we have many more spots, it's almost complete. That's probably too many, but anyway. Um, and there's the ton rings and the lattice with L. Yeah. So now, with this better spot list and a better idea about the reference, we can do the second round of unbending. Um, <coughs> the reference is the center of the first unbanned image, which is this one. Protein is black in this image. So this would be the central reference. And this is a 45 degree tilted sample, so this has no symmetry here, and black is the protein. Um, it's a cryo image, I believe. So this is running now. Um, it's doing CTF correction again, so what did it do here? Yeah, the CTF correction takes a lot of time. Oh, it has masked the image. It has masked the image where the crystal was present. So we remember in the middle there was no crystal in this image. Um,
in this cross correlation map here there was a zone with um or oh now it, it was masked yeah there was a zone with no crystal in the middle and this area has now been masked away if i double click this here and make it smaller um we can see here zones where there it's masked and it's masked with a gaussian edge so that we don't get any streaks in the fourier transform and only the areas remain that have a good crystal um, signature. And this here should now become a cross correlation map with the reference. And this is already the unbent reference. So we unbent the image, but for test purposes, we also unbent this cross correlation map just to check if after unbending, these spots are all exactly in the lattice nodes where they belong to. And here in the middle, there's no crystal, but in this right corner, after unbending, this looks better. Not perfect, but better. So the unbending, I think, does the right thing here. Um, <coughs> and the result of this is now a final Fourier transform of the unbent uh, image. And this Fourier transform has then very sharp peaks. Um, there's also an image where this comes from. Um, yeah, and this can now be evaluated or was evaluated and what we obtain is an APH file which is an amplitude and phase file that has lots of columns here and if I go a bit to the center <coughs> um, to the low, lower reflections this is a long file. So here are the smaller reflections. So the reflection 0, 1 has an amplitude of 4000 at a phase of 94 degrees and it has a background amplitude of 245. And the ratio between 4000 peak height and 245 background height, that's a very strong ratio which gives this spot an IQ value of 1. So 1 is a good spot. The spot 0, 2 is almost absent. There's nothing measured and the background is still more or less the same. So that's an IQ 9 spot that's missing. 0, 3 is weaker, is 2000, so it's still an IQ 1 spot. 0, 4 has an amplitude of 1000 and a background of 190, so that's an IQ 2 spot. And so on. And here's the face values. And the face values go from 0 to 390 degrees. Um, so this is the result of unband 2. The next is movie scripts and nothing happens there because we don't have movies here. Um, so they just skip. Um, the import function set this flag enable movie mode to know so these would skip. And then here's CTF correction part 2. There was part 1. And CTF correction part 2 is rather fast because it only works on the amplitude and fi phase file that we just looked at. So there's an input file and there's an output file. And the output file is now CTF corrected. Um, so it looks as before, we have an amplitude and a phase, but these phases are now sometimes um, 300... Oh no, that's actually not true. So this was CTF correction mode 1, which means we had done phase flipping before. Um, and the only thing that remained here was amplitude correction. And this should not have done anything because the amplitude correction on a tilted image can't be correctly done. Yeah, so this should actually have done nothing. Okay. Yeah, and so now we have an amplitude and phase file and with that we can compute a map um, which is purely based on this text file amplitude and phase. And that is here. And oh, and this one, the contrast is still wrong because this was a cryo image. And here, this parameter invert contrast of the final map is still on yes. Yes is for negative stain. I need this on no for cryo images. And if I run this with a contrast no, then this image shows white protein. This W sign here is my protein, I know this one. This is under 50 degree tilt, my white protein here. And there's one, and there's one, and there's one, and there's one. 
Um, <coughs> so then we are done. We can look at this file also um, as PostScript. Yeah. So what is still wrong is um, this is a tilted image, 45 degree tilt. I should have looked for one that has zero tilt. And then you would go to the custom script evaluate lettuce and find out what this to find out things about this lattice um, and with this script you could find out the symmetry of the space group yeah, which in this case is P4 um, on a non-tilted crystal you can find out that this is P4 or actually it's P4212 I think and the unit cell is 134 by 134 angstroms let me see if I run this again. Yeah, and this. So, since I typed in my magic knowledge about this crystal, which you can get from a different crystal, which is then a non tilted, you start with a non tilted sample. I typed in the unit cell length, and that allows this program to take the lattice vectors, which we have. Um, the lattice vectors are these here, 39 and 18 and 33 and 35. These are the lattice vectors in Fourier space. And with this, this program, EM tilt can compute the tilt geometry for this crystal, um, taxa and tangle, and this can be computed back to tilt axis and tilt angle. Um, and now we can compare these values that are based on the lattice vectors with the values that are based on the defocus gradient and they fit rather well. <coughs> I usually trust the lattice vectors more, so this 44.8 degree tilt angle is probably the case and not 48.9 which was based on the defocus gradient. If your pixel size is a little bit off then the defocus gradient would be wrong, but the lattice distortions are still reliable. So, and because the tilt angle is more than 25 degrees, um, this should have taken over the the no it didn't so it's still in 38 so determine tilt geometry from letters I set this to yes and then this should take now the tilt geometry from the lattice and overwrite doesn't do it. Should overwrite the lattice. Okay, I'll look into that. It's a bug. Oh, it's here. Is it that? Yeah, that's it. So, it's not really clear what this is for. This is for the script that runs, but the script evaluate letters. So, this tilt geometry is for the script for this one here. To that's this parameter. Uh, Where is it? This one here. Determine tilt geometry from the lattice for the get lattice script. But in the custom script, evaluate lattice, um, the parameter that decides here is overwrite local tilt geometry, this one here, so that this evaluate lattice script can overwrite the tilt geometry, which is just which it, which it just did. So this allowed now the tilt angle for the carbon film to be corrected to the 44.8 even though the defox gradient said 49. Yeah, okay. Um, so now, now we would know um, the absolute lattice and we could go here to find lattice which is then more reliable. Let me just try this out. Because now we have 34, 134 and 134 as lattice vectors. 
and this can now find more than one lattice this find lattice script so where is that um, it only found one yeah it only found one lattice okay sometimes it finds two not on this one so if I go to this image well it looks to me as if there's two well, there's one and the second one is not defined there should be a second one yeah I don't know okay we found one so then this image is processed and if you now go back to the library um, <coughs> I think I have to go up and down then we have here the image before drift correction and after drift correction which are the same files because there's no drift correction happening here it's not a movie so this is a useless image overview but the drift overview is also useless because there's no drift um, the processing overview is interesting there's a ton ring fit looks good this is our unbanding profile where we had in the middle no crystal this is the IQ spot IQ plot after unbending and this is the white protein the W that's that's the good view here and this is the merge overview we are not yet in merging um, so this is the good view and then in these columns here we have corrected the pixel size to 134 uh, the specimen number is not of interest here so the specimen number we can take away numbers of frames is also boring probably just one for all of them um, QVAL and QVAL2 is the same um, if you have movies then you have also movie script A and movie script B and they come up with quality values and then you can compare these three quality values but since we do not have movies here I don't want to look at the QVAL um, A and B and it's only QVAL2 and QVAL is just the same as is the highest one so I take the QVAL out um, we are not yet in merging, the merging phase residual we don't need this um, and these are also the IQ statistics for merging spots um, tilt axis and tilt angle is defined here and what else do we have here there's an original stack name, we don't have movies so we don't need this stack um, or the comment I could have kept and the error is yeah, I can leave it there and the comment is there so this was now one image we have others so I can now select a few others let me not select the first one or oh, I just select them, doesn't matter so I select them by clicking them on and then for these selected ones I want to run the following on these so what do we need to do with them we need the first import script which takes the TIFF file or MRC file and transforms it to an MRC file with the right name then we need all these 2D crystal scripts and I click the first and then with shift I hold down shift and click the last one then that's all of them they're all selected here I could take these movie scripts out but it doesn't matter I mean they're just skipping so but I can take them out here um, so and if I click continue these go into the batch queue and the batch queue is this central tab here um, so you can say this batch queue should start automatically and start this here so here's our batch queue <coughs> and these images are all in there um, all these scripts that we just chose for all of them um, and I can set this batch queue to run a bit more than just one, maybe ten in parallel to keep this machine busy um, CDF find is the slow step in this process right? so maybe to accelerate this now for this movie I can put this CTF find to 
not searching for the tilt geometry and we want to run GCDF which is much faster. That's a global parameter so if I change it in image number 13 because of this globe here it will be affecting all other images also. The global parameters are always valid for all of them. This by the way down here is the measurement of the 7x7 defocus values that CTF find 4 had done um, for this table here and um, these one fit to a plane where you have less defocus top right and more defocus bottom left and that was this tilt axis there what we had before. So the processing Q here is still working only on the first image. Well, So we had this set to one job in parallel before and it only checks this number once the first job is finished. So we have to wait until this first thing is done and this still launched CDF find. Yeah, okay, so then that's what it's doing. And what is this one here? This should be NVIDIA SMI minus L3, so all three seconds to update what the graphics cards are doing. So now the CTF correction script is done. Oh, CDF correction in stripes, yeah, that also takes time. This was a defocus determination, lattice, sample tilt, and this runs on image number 29 now. We're just in some random order here. Um, so this works at the moment on image 29. First tilt axis and tilt angle is already known. But um, the other values not yet, but should come in soon. Pixel size was already corrected. What is this doing here? Still an unbending and then masking the image with the automatic masking of the crystal for area. And the masking after masking is again doing CTF correction in stripes. Yeah. And now it should slowly be finished. There we are. So there's a Q value which is very high. And the image name was changed with an M in front, which is the masking. And the crystal here seems to be only in the top corner of this image. Um, and there's our white protein, so this is again some tilt. Yeah, if I go to this <coughs> image, the tilt axis here, and tilt angle is 30 degrees here. Um, so if I click on the image, that is the image, which one is this, before masking or after masking? Now to the focus grays out. It's busy, probably launching lots of the other 10 jobs in parallel or so. So this is the image. This looks contaminated with water droplets and the water droplets have the white halo. So I have this function shift F which is the local Fourier transform. So um, selection based FFT, shift F. And with that I can make a little Fourier transform here and then when I click with the right mouse button it calculates the Fourier transform where we just are and with the numbers on the keyboard between 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 I can adjust the contrast of this. So with 9 I see the tone rings and with um, 3 or 2 or 1 I see the lattice spots but at the moment I want to look at the tone rings um, with 8 for example and I can zoom this up with plus and minus on the keyboard but I stay with the normal view. So if we now are bottom left then we have 
click the wrong mouse button. So I need larger window. And then top right is ton rings this size and bottom left is really smaller. So I can verify here that the ton rings really are the smallest bottom left. And along this line the ton rings are roughly the same. So this is the tilt axis direction. And if I display T then it says less under focus here and more under focus there and this is the tilt axis. So same tilt axis as before. That's good. So with escape I go out of this. Computer gets slow now. Um, there's lots of things running at the moment. That's a bit too big. And I'm still working with TeamViewer here, filming the screen on a Macintosh. Um, yeah, so the CPUs are busy and from time to time there is um, some GPU work required. See what the processing tab is doing. Well, they're almost all done. Okay, I could add the others also to the queue. Come on. So from this one to that one. Oh, I first deselect all. And then I select only these lower ones and feed them into the queue. Um, we are still having a bug in focus, which is that <coughs> if you have selected many images with a cross here, then the GUI gets very slow. So this doesn't play a role right now, but if you have like 4,000 movies recorded and on a three-day session on your Titan or so, and you select them all with this button, then the GUI is sluggish and the GUI is much more reactive if you just deselect them. So whenever you don't need to submit them to the batch queue, I usually deselect them. If you want to single out some of them, um, you can use these color labels here yeah, and flag them in different colors. And now we can sort them by this Q value, quality value, and then the best image so far is probably this. Oh, the lattice looks... That's probably a wrong lattice, and that's why the Q value is so high. So here we want to see two by two unit cells and it should look like this here where we have one unit cell like this here and then a second one to the right and the bottom one here but this image here got the wrong unit cell so I go in there I think it's a non tilted crystal um, and the lettuce was wrong so Or is it still running? Oh, we didn't determine any tilt geometry anymore. That's that's okay. So yes, the origin shifted power spectrum. Okay, that's that is a tricky one. And it here took a lattice that is too small. Find lattice got the wrong one. Um, I mean, it got the lattice, but there's three spots and there should probably be only two. So I think at the moment, <coughs> at the moment it says, here's the first one, this is the second vector, but probably the first one should be here. So we, we could do this manually, but we can also go to this evaluate lattice, which has some lattice, um, functions here. So I can rotate this or scale. So I grow the image, uh, the lattice, and rotate it by 45 degrees by replacing the H vector with H plus K and the K vector with H minus K. And you will see in a second what this does. So this rotates. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, there's a bug. Okay, I'll look into this later. Okay, then the only thing I can demonstrate right now is to do this manually. So on the origin shift power spectrum, um, this is our current lattice, and then I do this 
manually with shift R that is refinement shift R and then I think oh it actually did something this script it just crashed after I did what it wanted to so but now we don't have this spot anymore so I think this is one and here is two so I double click here and then it corrects if you can see this I double click in the vicinity and it jumps onto the highest peak there by double clicking. If I double click here it jumps to the wrong thing but if I double click here then it jumps there. So and I think this is 2 0 so then um, oh, this mouse so I, I just define this here as 2 0 and add a point and then if this is 2 0 then this would be 0 2 I believe and if I accept this lattice then it might be this. Now I add a few more high resolution spots like this one and already computed this should be 4.4 4 based on this lattice so I just type enter um, so I just double click in the vicinity there and then it jumps somewhere where these are and now I accept it and it's slightly corrected. Okay I go out of this now we need um, with this we need to run just the remaining steps again. So we don't have a defocus and tilt axis determined. So CDF correction is only doing only one single stripe, not many, and then it's faster. and masking is already done that's also faster so <coughs> here we are now it looks correct this is how it should look like white is protein the tetramer here and this is the p4 2 sub 1 2 symmetry um, yeah and so if you look at this Fourier transform this is the original Fourier transform here from this image. We make it darker. Yeah, not brilliant, and more than one lattice. But that's it. And ton rings are correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I manually corrected one. I'll look into this lattice bug in a second. And we only determined the tilt geometry for two of them, and all the others are processed here. Um, so for some, it's still running. The ton ring fit isn't there, or what is missing? Oh, we switched over to GCTF, and GCTF didn't just compute these. Yeah, that should. So the file is not linked up. Yeah, but at least the final maps look okay for some of them. This is a random selection of images. And these last ones, well, oh this one worked, but this is the other file name. That's a, oh, and this, this is a, a different set of images. This was a 2K image, not a 4K image, and this is why it took the wrong letters. And this is a totally different crystal, and there yeah, nothing worked, I think, with the current setting. I don't know the details. It didn't find any unbanding procedure. That makes sense. Okay.